we had two, two yeah, slightly different approaches to the whole thing. Uh, one thing was go one by one in our heads through the pipeline and uh, figure what are the things that um, just keep us from just having a very streamlined um, decimulation process and that so that kind of the chronological um, order and uh, they would just figure that there's uh, things like um, well, this structure repair as we call it that is all kinds of fix up like uh, adding hydrogen bonds, adding ions uh, in certain places. It's not very sanitized, it's um, not very easy to describe, it's not very easy to um, follow through, so that is uh, something we would like to see taken action on. Uh, we figure it's, uh, it's relatively difficult just uh, because there's so many different ways of um, fixing up things and uh, not a very good standard. Uh, so do, do, you, do you envision just one tool that everybody would use or uh, as a common way of many tools being able to be used on the same thing? No, I, th I think this goes back to everything we had uh, today that it's mostly about ontology, it's not so much about how you implement things. You know? that is, um, do we have a way to say that I added hydrogens over here, uh, do we have a way of saying, okay, this structure was incomplete when I did these few fix-ups? Um, Ups, um, so, and then we shouldn't care about what tool does the actual job. An ontology for operations you performed on it? Yes, exactly. You, yeah. you would presumably also need a common format for representing the thing that has whatever atoms you've already put in it, right? Uh, yeah. Still, I, I mean, we did, didn't discuss that so much, so that's <laughs> just okay, my, my view. I, to, I, would say, yeah, I, yeah. I would still prefer to yeah. say structure repair. Yeah. Uh, kind of the. Uh, <coughs> I'm just taking notes. The, the way of uh, describing what you've done uh, is the first thing yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an group quick. Can, can we use the whole spectrum? Is there anything that's all the way to the like, left on a part? Yeah, we can like... Run no, no, the, 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 over, the, over there. There's, uh, yeah. So, so, but, but, but theirs is beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you use the whole spectrum. Uh, we, we, we are happy to share our... <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I, I just move it a bit, yeah, as I see it. Ah, no. Also there. Yeah, I would, yeah, so I, I would just keep it in whichever, whichever it's, an it's an easy win. win. <laughs> it's an easy win. It's easy to get. So you had it. Yeah. But pretty important. <laughs> then they saw so yet another thing. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, so. <laughs> um, then following up on this, uh, they saw, um, or even before that, uh, ligand and molecule parameterization standards uh, are lacking a bit. That is, um, especially if you don't use a, a standard force field or you start to modify uh, your force field um, also there. We miss um, even common language uh, to describe these things uh, and uh, a way to make sure that uh, also when we simulate a certain force field it is actually what we think uh, is happening. Uh, one uh, case, for example, are things like uh, Changing IO communities uh, would be a trivial um, thing. Uh, part of the community just did per default on uh, like Amber 99 because uh, sodium chloride was yeah, crystallizing. Crystallizing, yeah. exactly. But this is nowhere documented. You just uh, had like, either the patch or non patch for skill mm -hmm. that is horrible uh, for any kind of reproducibility or a smooth simulation workflow. So also that uh, that kind of thing that you say, okay, I parameterize my molecule, I use a certain force field. Um, uh, these things um, that they, they described uh, in a better way, a more sanitized way, and uh, that we also start using uh, databases with uh, ligand parameters um, more concisely. Better. Okay, so. so when you say standards, do you mean a standard way of describing how you apply the force field parameters, or a standard way of describing how you apply the parameters, or what, what's the... Well, the, the first and easy thing I think would be to give you a source um, and, uh, okay. so that we, um, we keep the source of the data in mm -hmm. our simulations um, for the so current you have so the front here. Yeah. Yeah. Then maybe <coughs> I'll just switch over uh, to what kind of tools we have um, for the setup already. And uh, well, we see that um, things we already do have to make things happen is uh, something like the charm GUI uh, for setting up simulations, for setting up uh, free energy calculations. So there's, uh, for example, something called PMX uh, within the BioX setup framework. Uh, there's sure other things are there. For the workflows themselves, we have a biosim space, common workflow language being developed 
in Barcelona OpenMF, for example. These are all tools uh, that are already in place for setting up workflows. Also, our MD software packages themselves uh, we have, and uh, that is, uh, I think, existing tools, but at the same time, it's also concerns and difficulties of the same posted because we see, and we just uh, briefly check Wikipedia, there's a uh, 60 uh, or yeah, more than 60, 60. Yeah. Uh, empty software packages. We just listed a few where we thought, okay, uh, they, these are kind of important, <laughs> and uh, over the day, uh, we posted this filled, uh, so that makes it makes it hard. Also, because um, uh, then uh, to take action, um, if you want to describe workflows and streamline the simulation setups, we would need some kind of a uh, um, comprehensive way of describing what these packages can do, what they require, what they need to do. So we would need some kind of a uh, way to listing commonalities between software, so to listing overlaps uh, and the that. Some kind of action item. Um, here. Then um, just uh, like this, and also with the um, as a difficulty and concern comes uh, that um, all these different formats. We assume we have sixty different um, file formats that makes uh, an end square um, of an for intercommuting between all the different formats. We okay. make it like that. So we have uh, something that's uh, like an end square problem uh, for a translation between file formats. And that is uh, hardly maintainable. Uh, things will go off scope, uh, things will not be implemented properly, there will be a certain transformation translation that will break. So that is uh, something we see in the end square. Yeah, if you go always to one back, exactly, but that, this is what we have, we, we, but we need some kind of a common object model to avoid yeah. an end square complexity. So that is uh, like as an action we um, we put it in here, say that. Um, but you need that type of a common object model so that you are sure you, you can do that all to one translation, and you know that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, when you do the translation something. Um, so and then along that goes. Um, Ah, no, uh, on, on a different sideline, um, but what we figured was extremely important uh, so that we start to modularize, on the one hand, our tools, so that um, no tool is a magic to an old tool, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, um, we are able to layer our tools and mix and match accordingly. That means we have a, a very clear um, distinction between uh, tools that do transformations of input data, that change input data, and tools that can bundle functionality. Uh, that is, uh, we put this under two um, key words, that is modularization on the one hand, but alongside that um, stratification, so we have a, like a clear layering of responsibilities. Very good. I recommend ladies. This is to have a gift. Um, then, alongside with this modularization need and um, like this historical debt we see coming with these uh, like good old tools, is uh, something this is also again related to standardized structure repair. Is uh, these tools that try to be automatic, and uh, we have this just this neat graph that is drawn up here. We see on the x-axis it's uh, the magic, <laughs> and uh, on the y-axis it's a catastrophic failure. <laughs> that is, uh, for a long time, you can just do lots of magic, do all the wizardry you'd like to do, um, not much happens, but then there's a critical transition and suddenly, very likely you just see catastrophic failure um, if you cross a certain magic boundary. So, um, we have this um, hampering our efforts at the moment. And, um, yeah. Then just in our collection of tools, uh, there's uh, still two mentions um, to mention MD analysis. And definitely is something we should use as an existing tool. And um, anyone, um, so like this. Any and I one, yeah. That uh, yeah. was brought up, um, but maybe you can say a bit it's, more. It's, there's a whole spate of people that are fitting 
high-level quantum mechanics with machine learning models. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the new types of interesting potentials for small molecules or proteins are these machine learning potentials that can run in things like TensorFlow or PyTorch. So the question of how do we make things interoperable with those kinds of uh, uh, neural network or, or deep learning based uh, methods. That's beautiful. Cool. All right, thanks. We'll Take your uh, thing off. Yeah. Who's next? How about we go over here? Let's put it for us. Okay. We'll start with. You think is the easy one, but it was pointed out to me. I even get, oh, I get this wrong all the time. Step one, it will help if our tools come with correct documentation, <laughs> which, was tested live. which was tested live. I forgot the minus p eight 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 colon eight 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 eight. But actually, the documentation for our tools is generally rubbish because we all don't like writing documentation because it happens after we've written the software and everything is cool. Um, Related to that is we need to basically develop more training material to develop and share best practice. So again, one of the things that comes up, I run these simulations, but actually what is the right way to run it? And the tool is not the place that defines the right way to run it, it's the community that should define the right way to run it. And when you do that, we become better at writing training material and developing and sharing best practice, which I think is a very important and maybe a little bit more difficult. The, but do you envision that as something a human would read and then somehow implement, or as something that would be a pipeline that somebody could run, like your example notebook? I think it's, I think humans will come up with the protocols, but I, and I don't know how, what the best way to represent them is, because the protocol is more than just uh, the data, it's actually executable as well, it's almost yeah. like a mini workflow. I mean, you have a protocol as an object in your yeah. example. Right? So yeah. is, that, is that what you're thinking about? Is that documenting these sorts of things or by writing the protocols? Or do you, do you mean like writing down all of the steps explicitly in the checklist so that someone can come in and understand it and implement that each time? I'd say it's the training materials of the humans also there we think it's live streams and notebooks, which okay. we do as, as training events. And we do lots of training events teaching you how to run MD and things using those. For protocols, I think they will eventually end up being things like objects, because mm -hmm. it's not just data, it's executable as well, which is an object, and I think having objects that represent protocols, and then having a mechanism where we can share objects which represent protocols, mm -hmm. and then you've then got into, well actually, we could do this in UML, we could do this in other things, but let's all do it in Python, because Python's fun. Um, and that's really what we had next, is make it easier to define and share protocols, which is kind of, I think, important, and heading towards more difficult. What's really difficult, um, but is really important, is that actually we're really bad with our tools of telling people why they failed. So typically when you run a parameterization and the parameterization doesn't work, it crashes, which is a really useless way of telling you it's failed. Or it might work, but it's done something badly wrong, like parameterize your NH2 group, which is a bit dodgy. Um, just because the, it didn't converge when it did the key calculation, but hey, it hasn't converged, we'll still give you charges. So we're really bad in workflows, we're actually reporting errors, and reporting errors in a way that we can catch them. So we had some way of standardizing, or at least documenting how the thing reports errors, that would be nice. Um, quite yeah. difficult, quite important. Kind of meant though, those NH2 right? Yeah. They're very bent, and you only, only really look at them, and normally the PhD student will only look at them at the end when they make the figures of paper, which is really bad. <laughs> yeah. I've done that. Um, I think it's really important that we improve the interoperability of tools. That really fits in with the modularization stratification. <coughs> Ultimately, we should move away from the culture of a PI and a group have their monolithic tool that does everything. And we will all live in that world, growing Rex, Dandy, Charm, Amber, blah, 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 and move to a world where actually you don't even know what software is being run because it's all hidden in a Python script. You know, all the algorithms should just be pick up or put downable, and we should have some mechanism of tracking provenance of code so that the person who wrote Pandas can see that's been having massive impact. Pandas, written by one individual, is being used by more, soft, more scientists and researchers, having more impact than any MD package. 
And yet that person who wrote pandas is almost jobless now. And he's just been picked up by non focus. And so we need ways of actually breaking this I am the person who broke the software and making our tools interoperable. And to get that, you kind of need to have a culture change. So we need culture change in the community to actually say we should get used to making interoperable tools. We shouldn't be making a brand new tool to do something. The owner of the software should not be the one who develops it. We should actually be happy that if you start a piece of software, you no longer work on it in the future. But one of the things I say to people who want to write new software is before you start, create your exit plan. Because you don't want to be developing and maintaining that software in five years' time. You don't want to be developing it when you're 60. So you start software, what's your exit plan? And have a culture change where people are happy for their software to be developed by other people. So does this require the carrot or the stick? Well, both. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's one of the things, so in the UK we have a software strategy that's being written and we're very much going, we want to make interoperable software, we're going to fund interoperable software, we're not going to be going down the monolithic route anymore. So the, the carrot is, we'll give you money if you're, if if you're money. willing to make interoperable yeah. software, and somehow that's measured and practiced during the... And that's what we're trying to do, we're developing metrics for measuring how it's being used, how it's being imported and those things, but ultimately just writing calls saying, the call is not write a new piece of software to do X, the call is, how can you make this something more interoperable, or how can you add new functionality to existing codes? And the fact we've got BioSim Space funded, which is ultimately just a load of file format converters, <laughs> was one of the first things that came out of this. We did produce new software, it's just file format converters. What about the stick? The stick, I think, is that as a community, we should actually shun tools that encourage you to do everything all in one package. You know, ultimately, you should not, we shouldn't have this balkanization, you know, as a PhD student, if you're being told by your supervisor, use this particular package and you will learn everything in this one package, so a classic one, but there's no one Barry of Arshav's group here before I offend anyone. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I really like Aria, we get on relatively well. But <laughs> the problem with Aria of Arshav's group is obviously they have their own software stack for everything. And if you've been in the Arshav group, you will be in that stack and you will never go out of that stack. And you have this whole parallel molecular simulation world that's existing in the stack. And it's fantastic because the methods he develops are 20 years beyond where we are. Obviously, we don't know how they work yet. But there was a whole career to be made deciphering the papers and translating them into something we can all understand and re-implement on the software, but that's another package. Ultimately, we need as PhD students to actually fight back and say this tool is something which I should be able to do this in other tools. I should be able to choose the tools I'm using. And I should be pushing towards tools which are more open by design and actually making those decisions early on in the project. So, are you suggesting that we also need to change the higher power then and supervise the future? Yeah, it's quite <laughs> important. Because actually, the other thing that came before is like culture change. You're being told by your supervisor to use a package because they used it when they were a postdoc. And so the package is 20 years old already. That's why in this field we are still doing the same things we were doing when I was a PhD student in the 90s. We are still using text-based interfaces and logging on with SSH, even though we have graphics now. Why are we using text consoles when we have graphics? It's Sorry. Because there's Firefox. It's much more expressive. Data sharing and cleanup, we need to basically share our data because we need to actually engage in a process where we're cleaning up the tools and cleaning up the data we're producing because ultimately there is a reproducibility crisis because we're just running a simulation and publishing the result immediately if something interesting happened in the simulation and we won't run it again in case it doesn't happen again in the simulation. <laughs> As I say in, um, in my software engineering parts, I try and get people to do testing. And I get them to do testing by saying, at the moment, the way we do testing in science is you run your script, and if the result looks right, it worked. <laughs> and if it doesn't look right, you fix the script until it worked. And that's the way some scientists do testing. But it, what we have is there are major, major retractions now in nature and science and other things where scientists have had their careers destroyed because the software was wrong, because it wasn't tested. We need to get people to actually do unit testing, regression testing, performance testing, and actually make it so we can take all of this data that's being shared and do something with it, i.e. rerun it with lots of different tools, so we can actually see which tools work and which tools don't, but then we can regression test as we develop new versions of tools. I'm getting the thing. Um, we need to accept just the discussion I had just now, and I apologize for this. 
We have a fear of writing software that depends on other people's code, because crumbs my code are rubbish, but other people's code is a whole cesspit that I don't want anywhere near my code. And we're terrified of depending on other people's code, so we end up putting everything into all one monolithic thing. And the discussion on having a single file format kind of revolved around, we want a single file format that we can write, so we don't have to depend on the third party to do it, but we'll give the single file format out as a third party tool for other people to use. <laughs> And it's a fundamental contradiction. You have to accept that we're going to have dependencies. To do any real work, you're going to build on top of other people's code. So we need dependencies. We have to accept that. I think it's quite difficult for people to accept it, so I'll put it up here, but it is an important thing to do. But then when we accept we have to depend on other people's code and depend on other people's software, dealing with dependency management is extremely difficult. Yeah. I hate dependency management. I hate Conda now. Um, and Conda is was like, um, did you know from Star Wars, you know, episode three, you were the chosen one. And there is a, a meme with Conda for that, because Conda was meant to solve all of our dependency management problems. But when you Conda install something, it breaks everything else and changes the version of Python for crying out loud. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to fix this. If we can, in the field, yeah. fix dependency management and actually all got together and said, let's make proper Conda packages, that actually respect dependencies and report the things they depend on, and we actually curate a standard set, so BioConda actually worked, it would make it so much easier, because then I could do Conda install Gromax, Conda install Lambda, Conda install Lambda, Conda install OpenMM, Conda install all of these tools, and it would work. That would be my promised land that I would love to go to. And that's why installing BIOS in space is such a pain in the neck. Because what we had to do is take Conda, install everything into Conda, lock the versions down, and then we create a binary package that you download and then you unpack it on your machine. And you never run Conda update or Conda install in that package ever again. <laughs> I'm going to volunteer mostly to help out on this because I know that my former postdoc, Levi Needham, is happy to step to wade in and help resolve some of these issues. I think some of the lessons could be shared a bit more broadly there. And then, yeah. your programs crash too much, sorry, but they crash, they're not robust. They're not sufficiently modular, I think has been said before, which is stratification. But these are all problems, right? These they are, are problems, things, yes, these, these are problems. Yeah. They're not robust, they're not interoperable. It's really annoying, the D3R challenge, we would have finished it probably last Tuesday but we're running the free energy calculations, they just randomly crash. <laughs> and it's like, this is the only field where we accept randomly crashing software is a good thing. It's like, would you want your Airbus, like autopilot, to randomly <laughs> crash? <laughs> and it's a significantly more complicated piece of code than the <laughs> package. Even if don't they have to reboot it once every How many bugs are we Yeah, 24 <laughs> days or something like that, or otherwise it will fall out of the sky? Yeah. I think it was the, the 787. <laughs> yes. That was they the same as the job of the software engineering has, has collapsed that much in the aviation industry, and I will now be flying Airbus. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's not interchangeable. Um, the other thing is about methods, is if we could find a way where we could actually publish protocols and share protocols, we can actually just say we use standard protocol X. So I used the, like, you know, Jameson group protocol X <coughs> for setting up ligands and almost give a GitHub link to it. And if we can do things like that, and actually you can always think about automating writing method sections, because that would be really useful. Difficult, but very, very useful. But you don't want to refer to only your proper point of method section, because you have to go 10 papers back and uh, 10 websites to find out what it's there. We're saying Gromax does this. Yes. Which is protocols.io, is an existing tool that does that, I think. <laughs> Um, and then the other existing tool is HTMD, and Biosyn Space is not an existing tool, it's an existing development. I will keep, as I say, it's not complete, we're still only halfway through the project. And what we're quite keen to have is actually people who develop tools, at the moment we're writing the wrappers around those tools ourselves. What would be really cool is if people who develop a tool like a tool to protonate a protein, or a tool to parameterize a ligand or whatever, we're very happy to talk to you and help you write the wrappers around your tool so that we can deal with giving all your file format supporting. You can then only deal with one file format and yet you can still plug into everything else. So it's, it's hard to put. And data publication, I can't remember. Just it would be really good if we published our data. Actually, I remember it was a PhD. Facilitating, facilitating the data. Facilitating. So the reason I came, so I've had too long in this career doing working in this field, hence I left it for a bit. 
And it was always in the case of being a PhD student where you always were given something from the previous PhD student and you had to reproduce it, or you then had a result in a paper and you had to reproduce that. And just getting to the idea that somebody would actually share their starting structures and their input files. And that was back in the early 2000s, people were not doing that. And still today, people will not share their starting structures and their input files. And they still hold on to them, thinking that someone's about to steal them from them at any moment and rerun the simulation before them. As I said, all of our input files and starting structures for our D3R challenge are on GitHub now. As software developers, when you're coding, it's live going onto the internet now. You know, it's not waiting for publication and three months later that you publish it, you're doing it live. Yeah, can I just also say, can you also try to dig through other people's data? Because then you oh, waste the research data to manage them. Because, and then, that's, I think that's also really important that we keep mentioning it, because if you share a bunch of files, you call them file one, file two, file three, it's naturally <laughs> useless. So there's no point in doing that. That's also really important. You mean the structure of why is that? The better nature of the projector. You can share it on. I was looking at the project around that. It's not going to vote on it, doesn't it? You can do more exercise this way. We can go for a run. There you go, guys. Uh, so, I think we all agree that if you want to reduce friction, we need beer. <laughs> that's a <what you're> mean. <laughs> How is it not important? I really object to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm putting I worked hard with this beer. <laughs> but then it was a bit too much. I think they're balancing basic squares. Yeah, also, he, there was nothing there. Yeah, okay. Put something. One thing that uh, has been mentioned already that really reduces friction is when things are documented. Uh, documentation is somewhere on the board. But the right picture of the, the bottom, on the right? Yeah. 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 Handwriting yes. But documentation is good when you already know what kind of what you're doing, and so training is important as well, and training is there as well. Mm. There's a big overlap between the yellows. <laughs> Uh, then, this is one of the things that actually all of this documentation and training would reduce the inertia there is within a group to use that specific tool. Because a specific tool is used because the PI said so, but also because there's an expertise in that tool, people know how to use that tool, people do not know how to use the other tool, then you need to lose three weeks to learn how to use this other tool and then you hope for the best that you are using it properly so there's not enough yeah we, we are not looking enough to the other tools the ones that exist already and this is part of this is partially because of documentation and training black so uh, there have been efforts to address that for example Molsi has a giant database of a bunch of random stuff in Comcam um, <laughs> but has that been <laughs> active for that yeah but then does it? That's not true. This okay. We know it exists. We know how many lines of code there are because that's one of the fields in the database. <laughs> but it does not tell me how to use it properly, and I don't know if I used it properly until I have training. Um, so there are many tools, and we should have more tools. But that requires the tools to be modular enough, so they only do their thing and they do it well. And that would be highly facilitated if we had a common data model. And we go back to the first topic of this morning. The, uh, we do not have this common data model that is agreed upon yet, but we do have tools to convert between file formats, between broad Project. We have John GUI that can produce his input for many simulation engine. We have AC pipe that can convert topology from some format to from some format to some others. So there are things there. It would just be easier if we had this common if we could agree on what a bond is. Uh, so we have all these tools, all these tools are dealing nicely with what they know, but then 
we don't do all the, we all don't all do the same thing because then we don't need to be that many if it's always to run the same simulation. So we all run simulation with stuff that are slightly weird, that are not covered by the tools. Like this weird, pro this weird post-transactional um, modification. Suddenly, it's your protein is not a single, is not a linear polymer anymore. It's a branched one. PDB to GMX breaks, and so we need to be able to be more flexible to to what this non-generic aspect that breaks the assumption of the existing tools, which comes back to the documentation, because often it breaks because the assumption is not documented. Mm -hmm. How many of the, how many tools assume that your atom has an element? I'm doing coarse grain. I do not have atoms that have an elements in the periodic table. I have to lie to open them. <laughs> But then we have all these non-generic cases, they exist, but nobody knows about, well, the tool do not know about them. And so if you're not careful, you end up with something that appears to be right, but does not account for that weird molecule that was there in your file and that got removed magically. So we need sanity checkpoints to identify, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, and actually, this has been mentioned already. This is... The error, error reporting or something? Error reporting, yes. Which Meaning, I lost. Meaningful error message or something. Uh, it's error reporting. Maybe an error. Well, I guess we can find it at some point. <laughs> uh, challenge? And finally, one of the problems we have is that people who write the tool and the people who use the tool are less and less the same people. And so, when I have this strange case, I need to report it in a meaningful way to the person who's writing the tool. And this is a comment, and the tool, and the developer, and we go back to the documentation, need to say, hey, I made this assumption, be careful with your stuff. And this is a feedback loop between developer and user, which we need and is not completely defined yet. I think I've covered all the post-its. Shall I go back? Final group. Not great. Not this way, buddy. You really could just hand the paper up. Yeah, then I have to stick it to something. There's tape. I brought tape. There's so many solutions to this problem. Are you, in, are you imposing your workflow? I'm just <laughs> spitballing. <yeah. laughs> There's no way of doing flip chart management. You guys are out of the box thinkers around here. So I'm, I'm usually among the groups here. We identify things that weren't important. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we haven't required the frame shift that a lot of your discussions have. So, critical among the things that we think are easy ones. Um, are that we can have validation suites for force fields. Particularly as a code developer, I frequently get requests for, please, can we have Charm 36 or Amber 21 or Amber 14, whatever the latest version is. Yes, I'd love to. Please show me the GitHub where there are all of the inputs and outputs and the values I'm expected to reproduce. But what we have in Gromax at the moment are all the things that got contributed ages ago. I can't say yes, this absolutely means something faithfully, unless there is a test case for the force field. We don't just need tests for software, we need tests for our physical models as well. That comes in multiple forms. Validation suites we need. There are hands flying. Yeah, finding what is meaningful to validate the force field is not that trivial. There are some things that are easy ones. We should have free energy cycles that add to a free energy change of zero. We should be able to reproduce with, within the limitations of the force fields that we parameterized, things like densities and free energies that transfer from one solvent to another. These sort of things. We won't exactly reproduce the experimental data, but at least we should be able to, between code versions and between codes, be able to reproduce things. If we can't, somebody needs to go and investigate a problem. Well, what you need is just to reproduce the single point energy. 
Give it a That's the place was. Otherwise, you're involving like yeah. things that are not having anything, anything to do with the force field, like your choice of Veristat, their choice of Veristat, which is important, mm -hmm. but that's a capability of the code rather than a force field. It comes back to usability of the users because they don't know what to choose. Oh, right, right, right. There are tools in their hands to evaluate what to yeah. choose. Yeah. But in terms of you being told you've got to support Char 36 in Romax, you just want to be able to show that you can reproduce the energy that's recorded for those molecules. Sure. Because then it was I think, I think a horror, I think a horror was example was Amber. Be so between Amber 9, uh, in Amber 9 we had. 8 and 9. <laughs> we'll say 8 or 9, whatever. In one version we had identical results down to the uh, thirty point epsilon. And then silently between Amber 8 or 9 or 9 or 10, they changed the way they interpreted their own torsions. Completely fine. The, sub, the reason we find out is that some people didn't match their results exactly anymore. Completely undocumented. Some they documented, some they did not. Uh, and the point is not to blame Amber, right? But the point is, if they had an internal test, then it would also be clear to them that we no longer pass internal that We have now updated our own regression tests. Had they done that, we would have also been able to, oh, they've updated their regression tests. Why? Because they've changed the interpretation. Good. Then we need to change the interpretation too. So as a community, when we hear someone publish a new force field, ask them, where is the test suite? Because it won't be available in your favorite tools until this sort of thing starts to happen. And, and test suite which should have a specific meeting for, for us to agree upon. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we thought something that was of more importance and also quite easy is to identify feedback to buy some space on their data models. Are these fit for the sorts of simulations that the community wants to be able to do? Are we able to agree on simulation protocols that are able to be implemented within the biosphere space time models? Is there something as tool and application developers that we could actually implement as a higher level thing that we currently have our ad hoc file formats and non-descripts they've evolved over 20 years data models? We should give them feedback because they are people working in this data model space that very few other people are working on. So <clears throat> the straw men that they are proposing implicitly and the fact that they've got a well-defined data model is something that we should either criticize if we can or agree with if we can. But that's, that's a very easy thing to do. As an application developer, if I'm aware of what the, uh, the data model is, hopefully there's some application about it, I can say, yes, I can implement that. Good. Rearrange the stuff. Done. And now we have something that's very easy for them to put, put Gromax shins around, for example, which hopefully will mean that the adoption of Gromax will be even more attractive. That, that's a win-win for everybody. Something that we thought was important, but a little more difficult, is in improving the user experience in terms of being able to produce parameters for ligands, particularly atomistic force fields. <laughs> there are people contributing to this space. There's relatively few people contributing in coarse grain force fields parameters for ligands. Uh, the theory, we, we thought that that was perhaps a little bit intrinsically more difficult because fewer people are working on the, the how to get that done is less well established. We're working on it. Good, glad to hear it. <laughs> I hear the dragons as well. <laughs> <laughs> so we have in Gromax a tool PDB to GMX. And jokingly, we, we rephrase one of the, the frequently occurring uh, requests that we have uh, as, as tool developers. Please allow me to just run my simulation. I want to give you a PDB code and then I want to run a simulation. So we jokingly describe that as MMSIF to TPR to invoke the Gromax simulation. My response to that is, what are you as the scientist doing? <laughs> if I can do that for you, why aren't you doing something more honest with your time? Because there's a whole bunch of questions that we as scientists need to be able to think about. Um, what correlation states make sense? What, is, what are the experimental protocols actually translate to in terms of something we can actually simulate? And there's a whole bunch of parsing of the text of the paper. I, I think there's a really important point there, because as we're making these tools more and more accessible to people, then also people who are not thinking too much about stuff are want to do it. And so that goes maybe to training or other aspects. Sure, absolutely. I can build an MMSF to TPR. Right. Oh. And yeah. it'll just be a random generator. I feel like it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a black box, like having just a black box which just does everything for you automatically. What's wrong with the black box if you know how it I mean, you have yeah, no like knowledge about like uh, which parts are important and more difficult. It's not, it's not the same, same argument. You need to like, know how to build the car to drive it. But, but you don't learn anything from setting up a simulation. You learn something from analyzing the simulation. 
Well, yeah, you but then you don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's ridiculous to think that there is like the the scientist as an artist is somehow shaping something uh, out of the the PDB file to get get whatever conclusion they're after. That's not. It's not quite true. We're, our, we believe, presumably, as a field, that there's a best way to do something if you're after a particular question, and that there should be a standard way of, of making the right decisions along the way that give you a robust simulation, right? So in principle, you could write this, provided you got some extra information. But what's the extra information that you would need to put out something that's not a random number generator? But well, what would that be? But that's what you mentioned in your example of uh, description well, of the method section. It could be something about the experiment that you're trying to reproduce, but maybe only certain experiments are amenable to that kind of mm -hmm. simulation right now. And like, speaking of the perturbation state, I think possibly people just use the default state anyway. So should, should we take those out? Sensitive? Would that make that code yeah. more usable? No, but I mean, <laughs> the point is that nobody can force you to do good science if you're not willing to. Right. And, but there are good tools that can make you and that can help you do this good science faster and more efficient. At least in limited domains, right? In limited domains. Like when you address like, when you address, that, like yeah. a specified problem, then it's fine. But like people should then know about these tools because many just don't. And like when there are good tools out, like it should be shared. It's going back. That's a. Yeah, but some people problem. would probably just want to run, you know, a <coughs> few nanoseconds of a protein in water and you just. So this could be could build up. Piece of little pH and uh, so, so zero point fifty molar salt or whatever, just uh, take some physiological conditions and it will make a lot of people happy. But one of the reasons people pay ridiculous amounts of money for modeler or ridiculous amounts of money for lots of the tools which they use in pharma is because they have really really good PPP to set up systems and codes. And they've got the protocols. So again, the credit suite, they put a lot of effort into taking PDB and doing it, and then presenting the choices in the GUI in a way where, it was, where they had to make a choice. It's like, OK, user, which is to do? And you just pick and choose the right one. You know, so it's making it really simple. At the moment, in the academic space, we really haven't tied these protocol tools together for protein setup at all. We don't have a good tool that does leap finding, because no one's really put effort into actually building missing residues at all. It's like a, it's an abandoned thing. I wish we had an open source loop modeler. Because at the moment, modeler is the only thing you can use, really, that works. And we're the ones making the notes. But, but, really but it's the closest thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that protocol thing. It's like, you need to go here. Yeah. <laughs> like some open source modeler with this. But is there anything that, anything in the tools category that does loop modeling for you, for free? You can also be built in Pine, right? Oh, well, there's a profit. Yes, yes, that's true. As is, as is Rosetta. Yeah. Yeah. And Swiss Pro, yeah. yeah. There are other loop modeling programs. <laughs> they're, they're escaping me in terms of the, uh, the, the, the certain ones that are being developed in Oxford by Charlotte Dean's group. By uh, Charlotte Dean's group, yeah. 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 The, the, the general problem with loop modeling is that it's a very narrow regime where there is a significant quality difference. For very short loops, everybody gets it right if they just close the loop. For 20 residues, nobody gets it right. Um, and then there is a yeah, there is a regime there is somewhere in between where some tools do better than others, but it's very relatively narrow. And but, but it's also so flexible. So you yeah, but, but I mean that I would like to have a simple script. And for the, actually, you could even argue for that reason, it's not that important to have the best new modeling yes. tool ever. But I would like to have a script that oh, I have six missing residues. That's great, fill it in. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's about this. In, we have this implicit mm -hmm. knowledge within the community of actually this will work or this will not work. And the John thing is not art. There are actually protocols which we teach our PhD students and say you do this, you do this, you do this. And it's just about we're finding ways of encoding those in shareable protocols. And then you can't want people about what you've been doing, but you say, okay, we've revealed those six missing amino acids for you. Are you happy with it? Yes or no? You know that you don't continue your workflow. Yes, yeah. you keep going. But I'm saying let's share those protocols of doing protein setup and they can set up so that you, you can basically rather than take it as this is the hidden group way that we build the ligand, the hidden group way we do a protein, we just share them and then we can all fight over who's the best in a public arena. Right. So what challenge the thing about from a user point of view, right? I very much subscribe to the idea about using other tools and if I grow back, we're gonna we're gonna kill the elite you mix. That's actually why it hadn't made a whole lot of progress the last two years because it's it's a kid sensing solution that tries to do everything. And the, the, the problem of fixing that structure is very different from the problem of typing something to a voice field. 
However, the general challenge for a user, of course, to be able to use any MD program or package <coughs> or something, you're going to need some sort of tools to prepare your input, and then you need to run it. And I think it would also breed frustration of users if they're repeatedly told, no, you can't do this, you need to find extra program one, and two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven. While on the other hand, I also know that Linux distributions, they really hate it when you somehow just aggregate and pull tools into packages, because suddenly you're going to have 14 installations of that in your Linux system. So maybe we need to find some way of, I don't know, but maybe either grouping tools or making it easy to pull down these tools or somehow so that they can be maintained externally, but when we actually install them, you will have them installed as part so, of the package. So this is what my hope always was with Conda. So when we originally built, it was actually, if the tool didn't exist, it detected it and then did a Conda install. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful there that we did that beautifully until we realized that Conda's fundamentally broken. And if we fixed the, the managing dependencies problem, then actually the user shouldn't see this tool doesn't exist, it just dynamically pulls it from the cloud. And we, we talked about that over the drinks before, that so it's, it's easy to start new things. And I would actually <laughs> hide them, hide this, them is partly full. This, <laughs> this can work though, we, we yeah. do this all the time with our tools, it pulls down 40 dependencies that we don't have to write ourselves and it reduces the maintenance burden on ourselves because we can use well-developed and well-maintained tools and pin them if there's any other problems. So I, th I think it's something that can be solved as a community if we pull our so I want to give uh, Mark an opportunity to finish his thing, so <laughs> sit down with his beer again. Something that uh, we talked about, particularly from the Gromax point of view, is that we need to work on separating our analysis tools from the preconditions that the analysis tools need. Do I need molecules made whole? Do I need to cluster things? Uh, from how do I do the IO, the post-processing is the early stage of this discussion. Um, because as a, as a community, we now can move away from, oh, I've got my directory somewhere out in the cloud, and I have to fix PPC before I can do anything else with it. Um, this is about separating um, the data model aspects of, okay, I have an analysis, it requires these preconditions, something needs to establish my preconditions. That might already be true, my user might know it is true, the user might have given me enough information in my topology file to be able to establish this precondition. All of these things will enable us to, to implement analysis tools in a transferable way so that we can get more interoperability, but only if we have a data model that actually works and that we develop analysis tools that actually announce what the preconditions actually are. Um, we have like five different variations of minus PPC implementation in Grubex. Um, I assume other people have similar quality sins. We need to work on this. We upgraded the need for documentation to be the need for stellar documentation. <laughs> Documentation in space, that is. Yes, yes, that's true. Documentation is particularly important. Nothing is usable without documentation. The single most valuable thing we found in the Gromex project for making sure that we can have tests to go along with new code and documentation to go along with new code is that nobody can change the code until other people have reviewed it and for this to be the community expectation. And for that, you need everybody, including the PIs who started the project, have to go through the same groups. You can't change the code unless you have tests on your code. You can't change the code unless you have documentation on your code, both for the developers and for the users. Stop doesn't have that. Stop doesn't go in. Period. We need, in the more difficult category, we need general, well-designed input-output descriptors. Perhaps that might belong more into to this sort of corner. Uh, and this comes back to some of the other more difficult issues that we've been tossing around. We don't have a good way of describing a chemical species in a machine parsable way that allows us to understand, oh, what is in this PD profile? Okay, this, I need to go out and build those models, more, um, missing residues because they're missing. I need to go and choose a propagation scrape. Oh, the user hasn't told me what the PKA is. I need to go and prompt them. All these sort of things will be difficult for us to grapple with at the moment. We also don't have general well-designed output formats either. All sorts of things need to get improved in that space, some of which we've talked about already today. And also in the long-term category, we need to start evolving high-level APIs that match good data models. Okay, that's a great work. Started in, in bias in space towards developing a good data model. And as a tool developer, I would very much like to be able to build upon that in terms of expressing a Python API that they won't need to write shins around because it will just flop. The data should be in memory, we should not need to be writing intermediate disks. All right, thank you so much. Well, okay, there's, uh, if we look at the most important side going from easy to hard, 
at least we have something emerging. Okay, it starts with better docs and training. <laughs> and how we can get there is uh, anybody's guess. Like, you've been good about enforcing that you have to have documentation with your code, but are there other ways we can encourage our, our community to do that? Um, <coughs> we have uh, modularity. We have data model, common data model. And we have APIs, which are pulling from up there, as Mark just mentioned. Um, we have escape from dependency hell. And uh, better error messages. And finally, up at the top, we need a culture change that reward, rewards modularity. Which people said was hard. So, all, you know, all these things are possible, technically, right? It's possible to write a common data model. It's possible to write um, good error messages. Uh, uh, there's some technical schemes that facilitate that. Um, it's also possible to resolve the dependency hell if we put in enough effort. But what's the societal way we can make sure that this is what people want to do or that people are encouraged to do this? People in this room are certainly motivated, but is there a way we can um, facilitate or, or uh, encourage that, that development um, through some, some change that we can nucleate somewhere? 